I'm uh, really happy to be here because uh, I, I really honor the goodwill and the good work that comes out of the Ethical Culture Society from what I have seen of it mostly recently. Um, and so I was going to start by saying, well, we're all adults here, but I did notice that there might be one uh, young youngin here as well um, developing there towards that. And uh, my question, though, is, uh, or several questions, is how do we know that? How do we know we're adults? When did, when did we begin to even recognize that that was what we are, if we have come to that conclusion? And how did we get here? And what does it even mean? Uh, so I want to offer a couple of possible ways <clears throat> to think about what growing up involves. And um, the first is to think of the teachings that emphasize growing up in terms of expanding awareness, awareness of the nature of reality, that work toward answering the question or focusing on the question, who am I? What is the nature of the true self? Uh, what is the path of enlightenment or awakening from the conditioning of culture itself and family? And what, what is it that we open to when we think of the word like spirit or the divine or the transcendent? And what would it be like to a, when a person evolves along that trajectory, they would presumably be more joyful, have an experience of inner peace, uh, serenity, uh, confidence, free of what we could call attachments and conditioning. They would be free of reactivity, more loving. And so let me share with you here a um, good worked, I think, right? You all see that? So that would be what we call, or I, I, I refer to, and some people refer to as the vertical dimension of growing up, a kind of spiritual awakening. The other direction, the what we could call horizontal direction, emphasizes our growth in relationship to the outside world everything that's out there, people, animals, nature, the, the planet, the many splendored universe of, of the infinite nature of things. Uh, learning how to navigate this world to learn the lessons it has to teach us and being a responsible, reciprocating partner with all that we encounter. So a person who's grown up in this way would be strong, wise, kind, loving. There's really no inherent contradiction between these two paths of development. They each involve time, though, that you devote to that development. And so there needs to be attention focused on them. And so some choose one, and some choose the other. And uh, as we know, some who choose one denigrate the other as a waste of time, a worthless pursuit, a distraction from the real life, what's essential as, as they see it. Of course, there's really no need to have that separation. Uh, the Taoists ha have an expression. They say the one, the two, and the 10,000 things. By the 10,000 things, they mean the millions of things, the trillions, the quadrillions, the infinite uh, aspects of what we call the universe. Uh, by the one, they're talking about the ever-present unity of it all that can be experienced as a unity, as a oneness, and the source of all of the many things as of, of, of life. They would uh, say uh, that the one is never separate from the many. So Western cultures tend to emphasize the horizontal direction. 
uh, how we relate to the world, growing up in that way, uh, developing skills to be a scientist, an artist, to have a family, to contribute to the world in, uh, as an organizer or an activist. Um, mystics and poets on, on both sides, uh, well, I would say the Eastern, uh, the idea in the Eastern world tends to be more the spiritual awakening, the vertical direction. Uh, we could say that mystics, poets on both sides uh, tend to bridge the difference. And indigenous people really just experience the, the growing up in one world, as one path, one world. There's not a separation at all. Uh, and uh, it, I would, let me share uh, here. So uh, this is what I would argue is what the world needs now. We need people who are uh, experiencing a growth in, in both of these uh, continuums, the vertical and the horizontal. Um, but that, that may be because I tend to be oriented in that way. And so I'm, I'm interested to hear when, we, when I stop talking, uh, some questions and comments about what other people have to say about that. I believe that humanity is really being called at this time to move in both of these directions, both for our survival and to thrive, to have better lives. So, um, let me give you back to me. Um, so I'm sharing this to offer a sense of what a, it could mean to say growing up in the world today. Uh, I, I want to offer some ideas on how we develop adults and have a culture of adults. And so it's helpful to have in mind, what do we even mean when we say growing up to be an adult? What are we developing towards? What's the intention of education, of raising children, of our, our, for ourselves even? Because I think many of us would say we're still growing up. We're still developing that which we are. So when did you become an adult? I'd say we all know that it's not when we got to our full physical size, when we got to our full height. Um, so growing up physically is not growing up. Um, perhaps many of you were bar mitzvahed or bat mitzvahed. And if you were like me, you'd have to acknowledge, no, that was not what made you an adult, even though they may have said, today you are a man. Um, not really, I doubt it. When you graduated high school, when you graduated college, if you went into the army, when you voted for the first time, uh, when you got married, when, when you had a child, if you're anything like me, none of those things really necessarily brought you to a awareness and a consciousness and identification of yourself as an adult. Um, some people would say when a parent died, that's a major event that uh, could be thought of as you coming to terms with your own adulthood. We've all had the uh, experience that of an awareness, at least with other people, of other people, that they're big grown up bodies and they're still children. Uh, we've had this absurd situation played out before our eyes where a person could become the president of the United States, the most powerful individual in the world ever and still be a child. We've seen that and we know that that's the case. So, and looking around, I think many observers would say that we live in a culture of children, of adolescents, uh, big bodies, big toys, and yet desecrating, destroying the very home that they live in. 
unwilling essentially to take responsibility and care for anything outside of their own uh, personal self. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you, just a quick sense, have any of you heard of the Kogi people? Not really, maybe, maybe you have and you don't remember, but um, they, they're an indigenous tribe that lives in the mountains, high, high altitude mountains of Colombia. And um, they have maintained isolation from the rest of the world and have continued to live in the way that they, they were living pre-colonization, uh, Colum yeah, before the Europeans came, which means going back probably thousands of years. And uh, so untouched. So let me give you a, a, a picture of what that looks like. These are these are Kogi people. Somebody. Oh, there's my dog. Hi, Muna. Can't come in now. Okay. And. Um, So they haven't really communicated with what we call, let me just close this. Giving lectures from home. Uh, with this, what we call the civilized world, the technological world that developed down below, but rather they lived according to their worldview, which anthropologists would probably call something like animism. That is, they attribute spiritual life or consciousness to non-human beings, even some non-physical beings. They have a very uh, radical uh, practice, which is that they select certain babies after they're, shortly after they're born and they take them into a cave of complete darkness and they stay there for nine years. Uh, they're fed and, and uh, talked, you know, communicated with by their mother and other teachers, uh, basically learning to, in consciousness, align themselves with what the Kogi people call a luna or the great mother spirit, what they attribute to being the source of, of life. And um, as, they, as they get to be nine years old, they come out and then they uh, become part of the society as priests, as wise people, because they are attuned in a way to this inner consciousness, higher consciousness, that uh, they work with. Now the Kogi people recognized at a certain point that uh, their own trees, that the air was changing in a very uh, negative way and they recognized that what was happening was the people down below, which they referred to essentially as children, their younger brothers, us, were doing things that were destroying the planet. And we're, it was even affecting the, them way, way, way up there in the high altitudes. And so they arranged somehow, somebody made contact with them from the outside world, or they reached out. I'm not sure how it, the initial contact was made. And they arranged for a crew from the BBC to come and make a film. And the film has become quite widespread. Maybe nobody here has seen it yet, but I, I can send you the link and you can watch it for free. I think it's on YouTube or some streaming service. And they called it From the Heart of the World, The Elder Brother's Warning. And they speak to us, the children, as adults, who have this 
understanding of how to live in harmony with the earth, telling us you have to change your ways. You have to grow up. And they uh, soon found, uh, as one might expect, that we didn't, <laughs> we didn't change our ways. No, nothing really happened and things started, started to get worse. And so they actually allowed another encounter because they actually sealed themselves off again, but then they opened it up again and they created another film which they produced themselves, which is called Aluna. And I can pass along links to anybody that's interested so that you, if you're interested, you can see either of these films. They're, they're you know, quick documentaries reaching out to us, to the younger brothers. It's been common for Westerners to think of such people as primitives, since they're unaware of our deeper intellectual culture, our philosophy, uh, much of the kind of art that we have. And uh, they're certainly ignorant of the technological genius that we ad advanced civilizations have developed, the big toys that we have. Yet they think of us as children hapless soilers of our own home, so fascinated by our toys that we are unaware or unwilling to take responsibility for cleaning up our mess. So they have a pretty radical rite of passage for cultivating the consciousness of those who become priests. But all cultures for millennia until the present era have had what are called rites of passage whose intention is to develop the consciousness required from the shift of being a child to being an adult. This transition, or you could say transformation, from what is a necessary stage of life, childhood, when we're dependent on parents for survival, for guidance, to when we take responsibility for our own actions, and presumably even for our own thoughts, our own consciousness. These rites of passage, which were such an integral part of what it meant to grow up, have almost vanished. The things I mentioned earlier, like graduations and bar mitzvahs and um, maybe ceremonies for going into the military, we can't really say they achieve the kind of shift in consciousness that uh, was meant and by these ceremonies that were done uh, in indigenous cultures and which our own ancestors were part of. Young people are then left on their own to meet this, what we could call an organic need, anything that has been a part of human life for millennia becomes sort of a part of our nature, part of the nature of what it is to be human. And this uh, aspect of growing up, this aspect of changing ourselves from childhood to adulthood by way of a rite of passage guided by adults has been part of what it is to be human forever until this fairly recent time. And so when young people are left on their own to meet this need, blind as they are to what it is they're even looking for, it's a feeling, it's a sense inside them. So what happens is they uh, reach out uh, with each other blindly to uh, perform something that gives them that sense of uh, change, you could say. And the, this is where gangs come, can come in. Uh, we can have drug abuse, uh, sexual uh, uh, abuse, and uh, uh, alcohol, committing acts of violence even, is part of what some young people uh, do to, to, to give, that, give them that sense of growing up. Those that don't find one of these kinds of things often fall into depression and we have an epidemic of depression, high anxiety, suicidality 
amongst young people today, which uh, of course got amplified by the pandemic, but I would say has been with us for growing with us for a very long time. I've even been exploring the possibility that OCD, uh, which is a, a common condition now, is uh, a compulsion to commit uh, acts that seemingly seem empty and, and meaningless uh, as rituals could be a grasping for the kind of ritual that would actually be a sacred and meaningful form that speaks to the need to uh, grow up. Um, so uh, almost always in traditional cultures, the rite of passage from childhood to adult is experienced in nature. It's considered that the young person uh, shifts from being a child of their biological mother and father to being a child of Mother Earth or spirit, as they might call the source of life that's within each of us. From that, we receive guidance for our path forward in life, how we are to serve, how we are to express ourselves in the world, whether our path is one of scientific exploration, investigation, whether it's uh, art, whether it's uh, organizing and activism, whether it's developing business, uh, whatever the path forward, it, to the extent that it's coming from mom and dad's wishes, we know it's probably not really what our soul is asking for. You're back. <laughs> So uh, we're looking for guidance from within and, and how, we, how we get there. And so I want to share with you one form of the kind of ritual or rite of passage that I'm talking about, which is very parallel once again, to what uh, previous cultures call the vision quest. And I became involved in this kind of work back in California when I was there back in about the early 80s. And I studied with uh, two teachers, Stephen and Meredith Foster, who devoted their lives. They, they kind of dropped out of, well, Stephen was a professor at a, of English at a university. And they both became so devoted and interested in the meaningful introduction or reintroduction of, of rites of passage uh, to our culture that they devoted their lives to it. They lived near the desert wilderness areas in California and guided people and trained people to guide others uh, for many, many, many years. And Meredith still does this. Stephen died uh, about five years ago. They were my teachers and uh, they founded what they called the School of Lost Borders. And they were instrumental in training many guides who now form what's called the Wilderness Guides Council. And again, they, they can be found online. They, wonderful people who are taking uh, groups, individuals out into nature for these kinds of experiences. So let me just share with you a few pictures of that. Where is that? Here. That's good. Like, can you all see that? So this is uh, just a start, a, a someone that you might encounter on one of these experiences. So I wanna emphasize again, the importance in respect to this passage that I'm talking about of, of growing up from childhood to adulthood to the role of ritual. Now ritual has a, to some extent, a bad reputation 
uh, amongst a lot of people because it's seen as, and the, pri the primary experience that people have had with ritual is often that it's very, it's empty and devoid of real uh, energy and substance and meaning. Uh, but meaningful rituals, and I define a ritual simply as any action that involves uh, symbols that represent aspects of consciousness with an intention to bring about change, change in oneself or change in the world. Uh, I might say that uh, a demonstration, a political demonstration, in effect, is a ritual. Uh, but I, I can come back to that and we can talk more about that later. So one of the things we do uh, in preparation for this kind of an experience is we meet uh, with a group that wants to uh, participate several times prior to going out over a period of months, perhaps weeks or months. And they uh, prepare by clarifying what it is they're asking, what are their primary questions in life. And I would say that even though I was emphasizing this passage from childhood to adulthood, many of the people that came out with me were in their 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s that uh, recognized that there was something about growing up that they still needed to focus on something about their childhood that they still needed to heal and uh, be able to move on from. And so we would prepare by clarifying what their questions were, what they were seeking, also how to deal with the physical aspects of being out in the, in the wilderness. We did this in Southern California deserts, but people do it up in wooded mountains and other places as well. Uh, you can see the Joshua trees in the background. And we establish, when we get out there, a base camp and then have uh, a circle that from which they're going to step out. They step into the circle and then they, we do a little ritual or blessing for them, maybe reaffirming their intentions and then they go off. Uh, I should say prior to this, they will have uh, found a place, go out from base camp and find a place where they're gonna spend four days and nights alone fasting. That's how we did it. There are other ways of doing it. Some people do it shorter amounts of time. Some people do it without the fasting. Uh, it's a water fast and so people will have water, plenty of water with them. And so then they uh, go through this process of, uh, sort of being blessed. Uh, and I have to say that, again, the ritual of doing this really brings home to the person's mind heart, body, what it is that they're doing. It takes it out of being an intellectual idea. What does it mean to grow up? You know, you're going to become a responsible person. And it takes them, it takes it down deep into this sort of the cellular consciousness of a person. Um, so checking on where I'm going with this. Uh, so they're going to spend, as I said, four days and nights alone, fasting, meditating, praying, writing in a journal, communing with nature, the land, the shrubs, the trees, the rocks, the sky, and asking their questions, opening to their intentions. They have water, they have enough equipment to stay safe, uh, but the journey is primarily inward. This is not like a conquer nature, climb a mountain, show how you can use survival skills. It's, it's to basically go inward. Inward while you're also experiencing the outer world of, the na of nature 
and how it is not so separate from you, that you can communicate with it, that you can hear and listen and learn from what you find out there. As I said, many of the, most of the people that I went with were what we would call grown up adults. Uh, but I've also done groups with uh, adolescents specifically, and that it takes on this more clear meaning of what is it that you're looking for now that you're at this stage of your life, where you want to go. So let's see. Here's a group that I took out. This is just some pictures of, this is the, an example of a tarp that a person set up, the kind of equipment that a person might have out there. We encourage people to use tarps instead of tents so that even at night, you're really open to what's there. More scenes of example of someone allowed us to take this picture. This wasn't really when they were on their on their quest where they're really completely alone. And you encounter not only Joshua trees and pinyon pine trees and junipers. Here's an example again of a ritual uh, set of objects that uh, mark the four directions. And uh, I took a group out of uh, young Jewish people who wanted to look into their Jewish uh, ancestry and their connection to their people and what it meant to them, uh, whether it was a religious experience or a cultural experience to be part of the Jewish world and uh, to really ask those questions very, very deeply and explore it with them. More possible encounters. So then people come back and we greet them in a similar way. And often very emotional. Okay. So an adult consciousness, which is what we're seeking here in this uh, process of growing up tends to include a sense of purpose, that one's life has meaning and inevitably that they are part of a larger ecosystem of people, animals, plants, the planet, and that you have a responsibility to that. For some, a focus on the vertical direction also became more clear than I talked about before, that they wanted to develop a spiritual practice. They wanted to learn more about meditation and uh, spend more time in nature with the kind of attention that they learned on their quest. So uh, it's one thing to be in nature as a recreational experience. I have nothing against that. It's a, it can be a wonderful thing to go camping, to go rafting, to just take walks in nature and feel good. Uh, it's another to be in nature with the kind of intention and attention that's cultivated on, on one of these kinds of quests. For myself, after the second time that I went on one of them, these journeys, I felt called to help others through the process. I became so impressed and enamored of what it was like to do this that I, I, I wanted to learn how to help other people go through it. And so I apprenticed myself with uh, the people I mentioned before, Stephen and Meredith, and spent some time living, uh, sort of camped out, living near them, and learning about their ways. 
the idea came to me to create an eco-psychology oriented therapy institute, which I called Holos Institute, set up a, as a nonprofit corporation in the Bay Area of California, which even though I left was taken over and it still exists and still doing that kind of work. So I felt like uh, out of my quest came this uh, creation, this almost like child that now has a life of, of its own. Uh, on another quest, I reconnected with my Jewish ancestry uh, from which I had felt completely divorced. I can honestly say that. I had almost like no connection to it whatsoever. And it, it gave me a, a, a feeling it gave me a feeling that I needed to explore that, that it was somehow important to me. And uh, when I, I did, when I came back, I, I started connecting with some teachers and people who had worked with um, the aspects of, of the Jewish religion that I resonated with. I had already been uh, deeply involved with yoga and meditation and um, spirituality but I looked into the mystical aspects of Jewish spirituality and started studying them. And uh, that's where the idea for a, a Jewish vision quest came in. And I followed through on that. And also the, uh, it both ultimately led that, that whole exploration that I was led to, led to my writing this book, Crossing the Boundary, Stories of Jewish Leaders of Other Spiritual Paths. In other words, people like myself, who were raised in a Jewish family. And uh, I know that a lot of ethical culture uh, came out of the Jewish world, although it isn't ex certainly not exclusively that. So I, I, that may be of interest to some of you. Um, so uh, to finish up just uh, the, my, my lecture and get into what could be more interesting, which is the, your thoughts and and questions, uh, I just want to emphasize the importance of ritual and sacred experiences in nature as a missing yet vital link in the development of healthy adults and a healthy society. Our minds could say are like gardens. We cultivate them with intention or not. We can choose the intention to develop what some have called an ecological consciousness, aware of our sacred, reciprocal, respectful, mutual relationship with all life. People, when people do that, they tend to do the right thing. They tend to help make the world better. So let me, let me finish by, um, Reading, um, where is it? Disappeared. Let's see if it's over here. Well, I'll just have to read it to you then. Uh, is it? Um, sorry. Um, let me read you these quotes from uh, a man, Thomas Berry. Some of you may be aware of him. He, he was a, uh, a priest, uh, but he calls himself uh, 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 I lost track of the word. But anyway, he, he's a wonderful guy. You should, you, you should really look him up. Almost everything he has to say is of great value and I think would be appreciated by you. Um, he says this to start with, the natural world is the larger sacred community to which we belong. To be alienated from this community is to become destitute in all that makes us human. To damage this community is to diminish our own existence. Another one, and this relates to the idea of growing up into who you are. What does that even mean? Is there a, a, a true self, a greater self? Some would say higher self, some would say the essential self. Uh, so 
he, he refers to it as the great self. And he says, the universe must be experienced. The universe must be experienced as the great self. Each is fulfilled in the other. The great self is fulfilled in the individual self. The individual self is fulfilled in the great self. The great self being experienced as the, as the universe. Alienation is overcome as soon as we experience this surge of energy from the source that has brought the universe through the centuries. New fields of energy become available to support the human venture. These new energies find expression and support in celebration. For in the end, the universe can only be explained in terms of celebration. It is all an exuberant expression of existence itself. So I would say that when people return from these kinds of rites of passage, when they emerge from a sweat lodge, from they come out of a sacred ceremony, there's a, a really deep, deep feeling of celebration, celebration of their lives and a sense of their, a celebration of their sense of responsibility. Rather than it being a burden, it becomes uh, a joy. So I'm very happy to uh, turn it over or, or ask, uh, respond to questions. It's sometimes better if people have actually questions to take those first and maybe and before you make uh, your own, share your yeah. own comment thoughts, if that's okay. <clears throat> Well, yeah, Alan, you want to give a start on it? Yeah, I just want to say thank you first for um, such a beautiful talk and uh, <clears throat> so much to contemplate. Um, I very much appreciate it. Um, and we do have time to take some questions. Am I coming through? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so you can uh, ask a question uh, and uh, try to limit the questions to just under a minute. And we'd like to hear from any new voices or persons who might not have asked questions in the past. And if you want to put questions in the chat window, you're welcome to do that. Um, and we can try to take questions that way as well. Um, and while people are, are queuing up, um, I just I thought I'd start by asking you, Alan, um, do you feel as though you have grown up uh, with you know, all the experiences you've had and the things that you've done. Uh, can you say that you are, are grown up now? Um, and, and the other question maybe I'll just throw in as well. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to do um, many uh, Native American sweat lodges over the years. Um, I've done maybe 15 or 20. Um, and I, I really enjoy them, especially on the physical level of, you know, just the cleansing and the sweating. Um, but they've also been um, beautiful spiritual experiences. But I'm wondering what you think about the lasting impact of having these rituals and these experiences. I feel like I, I do these things, but then I have to come back into my, my life um, of busyness and running a business and involved in politics and even the activism. And so I, I feel like it's good on the level of having balance in my life. Um, it balances out those things, but what about the lasting impact um, for the ability to actually grow up? Yeah, well, great question. Uh, and um, I, just to answer the first part, to be honest, I feel I have. I feel I have. I feel like I, I now own, or as people like to say these days, um, or accept my role as an elder in this world. Mm. Uh, that um, the work that I've done uh, gives me that uh, feeling and that sense. And uh, it doesn't mean I, I don't have infinite distance to go, you could say, because I feel like it, growth is infinite, you know, uh, but the, um, we arrive at places where we feel confident and, and okay and affirming where we are. 
As far as the lasting impact of any one experience, it's, it, one has to continue the work. One has to really continue the work. And uh, so having an ongoing practice, whatever that means to a person, you know, whether it's meditation, uh, whether it's uh, experiencing being in nature in uh, really conscious ways, whether it's prayer for some people, whether it's involvement maybe in a community that reaffirms the, what it is, uh, we're, we're not alone, uh, even if we go through parts of the journey in these more alone ways. And uh, we, we do need to just continue the work. So does it last? It lasts, but we need to keep, keep at it. The, especially in, uh, the way the world is structured right now, uh, the way the economy and the politics and the culture is organized, everything's working against an individual who's trying to stay conscious. Mm. And so we need all, all, the, all the help we can get. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Peter Kay, our Zoom master, and let you handle the questions, Thank please, you. Peter. Okay. Thank you, Alan and Alan. All right, we'll start off with Pamela Berglund. Oh. Pam, are you there? Pam, you oh, no, oh, okay. I was, I was looking for the unmute, I'm sorry. I have a really important question. Um, the exercises about going into the wilderness really, really interested me. However, I have a, had a little bit of a problem with it because it, it was only males that you were taking on these excursions, that you were taking on these trips. No. And what I want to see are females involved in this at all? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I, I don't know if you, said, if you noticed in the pictures, there were several that were women. There were, the group that I showed you yeah, happened to be, I have probably hundreds of photos and sometimes I've done, you know, a session just about this kind of work, but I, and I only selected quickly, maybe 10 of them before this, but sure, women lead these Right. And we, in fact, probably more women than men are involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. more, more women are, and then men are involved in all aspects of personal growth and, <laughs> and practice. You, you go to any kind of workshop and so forth, you'll, you'll find more, usually more women than men. Thank you very much. And I would say, just as regards that, that a major aspect of what I feel the world is going through is a, uh, a reawakening of the feminine. That's true for men and for women, the feminine consciousness. <clears throat> uh, and uh, that is a big part of why I think uh, the experiences in nature Mother Earth, after all, is often referred to as Mother Earth, that we come from the womb of the Earth, uh, is, is so vital. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Javier. Oh, you know, I was wondering, when you mentioned about the inner child that we have, and I wanted to ask you, the inner child that we have, it gets killed by society or we kill it ourselves? I didn't quite hear. The, the inner child, and where was the question? The question, the, the inner child that we have in us, it's get, it gets killed by society or it gets killed by ourselves? Did you say killed? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it's wounded. Uh, I don't know that it's ever killed, but I suppose it, one could feel that it, that it has been. Um, 
Yeah. Many, many things contribute to the wounding. It, it isn't really done by ourselves. It's done by factors around us, the, the way people talk to us and criticize us and, and limit uh, our sense of who we are and what's possible for us. And gradually we take that on and we lose touch with the vitality and the sensuality and the playfulness and the uh, exuberance and magicalness of, of the inner child, which is always really still there. It can't be destroyed, I don't, I don't believe, but it can be so encrusted and so uh, uh, we can become so separate from it because of the wounding that it takes a lot of work. It takes either therapy or some kind of therapeutic process. It doesn't have to be psychotherapy, but some sort of process to help us reawaken to that part of ourselves. But it brings up a good point that in my emphasis of saying we move from childhood to adulthood, I don't mean that we divorce ourselves from the child spirit, the playfulness, the healing power, the, the joy and all of that. It, it remains a part of us. It's just that we are, our consciousness expands to include this other aspect, which we call being adult or even an elder. Does that answer your question? It does answer my question, but it brings me to the question that the more successful that we are, the less child that we are like? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, I think we, like I say, we, we can retain this access to the playfulness and the spirit of, of the child and enter into it. But we enter into it by choice. As a child, totally identified as a child, that's what we are all the time. And so we don't take responsibility for the things that, you know, the consequences of our actions, particularly, and, and gradually learn. So, so as an adult, we can do that and have times when we enter into child, childlessness, silliness, you know, uh, playing around. Uh, but we're aware of the consequences. We have this larger consciousness that allows us to kind of keep it, keep it within bounds, you might say. We're not going to do anything that would be destructive or harmful to other people. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Diane. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, our mindfulness group has been chatting recently about forest bathing, Shinrin Roku in Japanese. Uh, uh -huh. how, yeah. can, how does that fit into your picture of go, using nature to repair yourself or give yourself balance? Meditation? How does meditation, how do I feel meditation fits no, into all this? No, the specific uh, practice of something called forest bathing. Are you- Oh, forest bathing. Yes. I see. Um, well, I guess it depends on what that really means, what that is. A lot, a lot is determined by intention. So if you go into a forest and you, I mean, I don't, again, I'm not familiar exactly with what you mean by forest bathing or what's, what's being done there. But I, I know that when people go into nature, they sometimes go in with, with a kind of recreational sense of it. And, and yet you can also go in and open yourself deeply inwardly. I think especially if you're including a kind of meditation practice while you're in the forest, while you're in nature, you're, you're going to get a, a very different kind of experience, one that's more transformative and more healing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Janet Glass. I thank you very much for your, your talk. Um, one of the most adult and mature and uh, conscious of people that I know of and uh, ecologically conscious is Greta Thunberg. Mm -hmm. six, she was a she was 16 year old Swedish student who has led a tremendous awakening uh, and, and gathered 
a tremendous following of young people um, about the planet and taking responsibility. Uh, she, I've seen a documentary of, of her life and she did not grow up with any kind of rite of passage or ritualized, uh, ritualized childhood. Um, how do you account for someone like her with a deep cellular uh, ecological consciousness that uh, with a very intentional life and that has become a leader and also the tremendous number of the millions of youthful followers who also probably did not grow up with the rites of passage and ritualized uh, backgrounds. How do, we, how do we account for that? Well, I don't know. I don't know that I can answer that question. Uh, I, I wonder about it. I know that I came of age and took on, well, I guess when I was about 20, a very, very strong commitment to changing the world and making the world better. And I also found later on that I did it with a lot of ego. And so I needed to do some more inner work with myself to be able to really integrate uh, a, a kind of deeper sense of the consciousness of it all. So I don't, I don't mean to, to say that in a way that might sound critical of Greta. She, I admire her. I think she's wonderful. Or all these young people that are out there. Um, but there is a deepening of consciousness that helps to sustain the kind of activity that young people often get involved with. And then we'll see how long it lasts. You know? I hope it lasts. I hope it's really deep and it's really meaningful and they really have an understanding of what it is that they're doing. Thank you. I think, I think in some ways, uh, you know, we have what's called a parentified child in psychology where when parents neglect and uh, fail to take responsibility, the children take over and they do and they become very responsible and they suffer. That's, that's what, I, what I can say about that right now. Uh, these young people are, are taking responsibility for stuff that they feel the adult world has uh, neglected uh, to do. And she does it, you know, very well. And she expresses the anger about that. She says, I shouldn't have to be doing this. Shame on you. You should be doing this. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Eric. Unmute. Hi, thank you. Uh, enjoyed the presentation very much. And um, uh, I've, uh, I've been to Joshua Tree uh, in California and I've found it to be a very uplifting place and, uh, and I enjoy meditation. And um, I was raised in a culture that was fairly rich in ritual. Um, I, but I personally don't have any supernatural belief. I, experience all of these things from a purely humanist and maybe even a psychological perspective as a manifestation of you know what it is to be human so i guess i'd be interested to hear what you think of of that as a, just as a purely experiential thing and the value of that oh i think it's wonderful i, I have no argument with with folks who who follow that trajectory and um with like I said, it's, it's uh, you know, the Dalai Lama himself, obviously, who, who has a strong spiritual take on things, has said that some of the most spiritual people he's ever met are atheists. <laughs> Thank you. So I like the, I like the uh, what is it, motto or, or thing that you say? Uh, it's about deeds, not creeds. Um, so it's really all about, it's in many ways, it's beyond beliefs. I'm not so concerned about beliefs in the supernatural. I'm concerned, uh, my interest is in exploring uh, what I, what's possible for me to experience. And so it has, that door has opened for me, for whatever reason, to be able to experience uh, 
aspects of reality, you might say, that are transcendent to the physical world. But what that really means to other people is another thing. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Greg Gordon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Levin. This was uh, very enlightening, and I really appreciated everything that you've shared, as well as the questions and comments that have come along with it. Um, uh, I guess my question is uh, a bit of an odd one, perhaps, and I know that um, sort of enlightenment or adulthood or however we, we phrase it, it's very contextual and it's very personal for everybody. Um, I'd say that for me, um, my transformation from being a kid and feeling um, liberated in a way that I could just be a kid, even though I had re adult responsibilities with a job and, and mortgage and things like that happened when I became a father. Um, and that should have been a very joyous experience, but for me, it was scary. I mean, I, as it probably is for many people, um, I seem to be fraught with fear and, and that my uh, life of carelessness or immaturity or what have you was now not possible. I needed to be a responsible person because I have a little person um, depending on me. And so my question really is, I think for many people, certainly the folks who are my peer group, have associated their rite of passage with some cathartic moment that's um, negative, a, 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 the passing of a loved person or some job loss or something that happened that was cathartic that made them sad, nervous, and they reacted and responded and all of a sudden realized they're an adult, they're, they're facing real adult things. In your experiences or how would you guide others to experience or get to that next level of of life that's not associated with something negative something positive is that does that happen often in your learnings and in your travels yeah i know you bring up a really good point the, you know suffering is is a major force in growing up uh and yet and, and many of the rites of passage if you look at it cross-culturally involve a kind of an ordeal and you could say that ordeal itself, where the person's prior self, in some instances, dies in their, in their mind. And there is an, an emergence of a new sense of identity uh, that, that, that comes as a result of a period of suffering. Um, and yet, that's, if that suffering is intentional, not like beating yourself up, but like if you put yourself through, rather than use that word, maybe an ordeal, if you put yourself through an ordeal with an intention to grow, to learn something, to deepen your sense of who you are, your awareness of who you are, then that can be a way of perhaps helping us to not have to learn from suffering that's unintentional. That's painful and 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 difficult uh, in a different kind of way. So intention is a, is a of, of the experience is, is a driving force. When we do a rite of passage, that person knows that what they're going through, as painful as it may be, because it can be. You could be out in really really cold weather. <laughs> you could be out there and uh, face creatures that are a little scary to her. You know, some people spend a whole night, the last night of their uh, four days, uh, staying awake, staying awake the whole night. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do when you're alone and you have nobody to talk to and you don't have a radio or anything like that going on. It's just you and the elements and you're up the whole night long waiting for that sunrise, waiting for that light to, to come up that tells you you've completed your, your mission there, your, the ordeal, and you've passed through it. And that's painful, and yet it's conscious, it's intentional, and uh, it's not the same as when you know, you're just dealt some heavy cards and you have to deal with it. Thank it you. helps you deal with those things with greater, I would say, with greater acceptance. Going through something like that intentionally helps you when life 
brings you some really very challenging situations like the death of somebody or a responsibility that you didn't know you were gonna to have to take on. Um, that's, that's a big part of what we mean by being an adult. Thank you, Alan. All right, I don't see any more hands, so back to you, Alan Berger. And thank you once again um, for such a, a, a beautiful talk. And uh, after listening to you answer all the questions and um, just your whole wonderful demeanor, I can see that you have in fact grown up. So uh, it's it's really been a pleasure um, to have I you. I have to ask my wife for validation. Of that. <laughs> That's right. Well, you, your dog seemed to think so. Yeah, dog thinks so. Um, so I, I really want to thank you once again for being with us today. And, and thank you all for being here um, and, and joining us today. Um, if you want to get more information about us, if anyone is uh, new on today's platform, uh, I think we're going to see a short video come up with information about how to uh, learn more. To learn more about us, visit our website, ethicalfocus.org, or email us at admin at ethicalfocus.org, and we'll get back to you. To make a donation, go to ethicalfocus.org slash donate. Please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can watch many of our past programs on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you all for your patience and uh, listening and uh, questions, and uh, blessings to you all. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.